Hey everybody, um, welcome to the culmination and the launch of the Forest is the Museum. Um, in its widest form, the Forest is the Museum was a two-year programme of artists in residence here at Fine Shade Wood, um, specially commended as part of the 2019 Nick Reeves Arts and Environment Award for imaginative and strongly place-based explorations of meaning and process in the forest in a way that is accessible to the public. Our first artist in residence was Edwina Fitzpatrick. Her archive of the trees, installations and publication addressed climate change in both scientific and anecdotal terms. Justin Carter's Blood from Stone encapsulated the area's historic relationship between natural and industrial with prints produced from homemade iron gall inks. Artist Collective Owl Project connected natural and computer systems producing the algorithm of the forest, a multimedia insp installation inspired by insect behaviour. <coughs> and finally, the culmination of Abigail Lane and Lila Murder Thuler's residency, also taking the name the Forest's Museum, an installation and the beginnings of a new body of work that recontextualises lost property found in these woods. The two-year programme was initially conceived by our former director and guest speaker here today, Yasmin Canvin, and as such, perhaps has some claim towards some of the intellectual property. <laughs> We're also delighted to be joined by Richard Wentworth, an artist with a celebrated history of transforming objects by breaking down their conventional systems of classification. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good, anyway. Our third speaker, Lala Mervifula, will describe and contextualise her and Abigail's residency. Um, before we start, I just wanted to share some words with you from Abigail's book, Tabitha. Our mental investment in material substance has the strength to elevate and breathe life into matter, just as our loss of faith, interest or energy can take life away. This is magic, this is art, this is beauty, this is power, this is life. Not bad. <laughs> this is Yasmin. <laughs> I'll stand here so that everybody can um, see the images. I'm really delighted to be back at uh, Fine Shade after being two years away. I had to go back in time thinking about the origination of the ideas for this project and um, several thoughts occurred to me and influences. The first was David Littler, who's an artist who we worked with at Furman Woods on several different projects. And he said that no idea comes about as an isolated thought, separate from the context that anyone is working in, but is the result of a collaboration with current thinking. And in a similar spirit, the idea and the name of this project was very much intuitive, rather than the result of a conscious theoretical process. And James has likened curating to being an artist. And occasionally, I do agree with him. Um, the Forest is a Museum came about as a result of eight years of walking and working in different parts of Rockingham Forest alongside, alongside a wide range of artists, communities and experts who all brought their own personal perspectives on these woods. My personal ongoing interest in curating and working with contemporary art and artists is to draw connections between art and everyday life how one influences or mirrors the other, and what that in turn means for the observers or the participants. And so being invited to speak at today's event gave me the opportunity to reflect on what the conceptual validity of comparing a forest with a museum might be. The International Council of Museums defines the museum as a permanent institution in the service of society and its development, and open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates and exhibits for purposes of study, education and enjoyment. And that it contains material evidence of people and their environment. The Council of Museums also reflect on what a wider context for museological activities could be. And they include things like natural, archaeological and ethnographic monuments and sites that acquire, conserve and communicate material evidence of people and their environment. <coughs> also, institutions holding collections of 
and displaying live specimens of plants and animals, and entities that facilitate the preservation, continuation and management of tangible or intangible heritage resources. So in literal terms, the display of live specimens within a museum context happens for a specific purpose, to provide the material evidence for conservation, <coughs> communication, research, education, and of course enjoyment. And as we all know, modern and contemporary art is well known for repurposing everyday objects. And by using this title, we in effect repurpose the forest so that it becomes a museum because we say it is. But there are also many ways in which the activities within ancient woodlands actually replicate museological activities due to their longevity and lack of disturbance. So fan-shade wood is part of the ancient Rockingham Forest. An ancient woodland is defined as land that has shown a continuity of woodland cover since at least the year 1600 in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and since 1750 in Scotland and the different dates are due to the dates of the first reliable mapping of the woodlands. There are four different categories um, within ancient woodland and fine shade contains two different um, categories. So areas of ancient semi-natural woodland, which is the minority, and plantation on an ancient woodland site, the majority of the area here. Now ancient contain highly diverse communities of plants and animals and in fact 80% of land diversity is held within forests. And the oak tree is the most diverse plant in the UK due to, again, its size and its longevity. And the oak tree hosts a collection of 2,000 species of fungi and 300 species of lichen in every single tree. And it provides nutrients, moisture and access to sunlight. So in a sense, it cares for and conserves its collections. In a similar way, soils in ancient woodlands preserve distinct species and natural ecological processes because, again, they remain undisturbed, deep underground, in effect, an underground store. And I think many of us might have been to a museum and headed deep underground to find um, good climatic conditions for storing artwork. In addition, soil and ancient trees are also important carbon stores and they are living archives that document and reveal information about historical environmental conditions. So during a project with Active Ingredient at Fine Shades that was actually in this barn, we learned that carbon dioxide was only measured and recorded in the 1950s. So in order to reconstruct the constitution of the climate before then and estimate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, scientists have had to analyse core samples taken from the trunks of mature trees. And this just shows that um, being plotted out over the years. Ancient trees can also be classified as archaeological relics in their own right. And that's due to the effect of human activity on their age and their structure. And for example, Edwina Fitzpatrick's project here, the archive of the trees, looked at the effects of man-made uh, pollution on trees. She also um, cited quite an interesting cultural um, value of trees. When she gave a talk at the Sainsbury's Centre, um, she said that images of the Haywain were actually put up in the trenches during World War I to remind the soldiers of what it was that they were fighting for. So really significant, deep um, value. The classification of both trees and objects can also have far-reaching consequences. Um, at Fine Shades, the Forestry Commission, which is under constant pressure, of course, by the government to increase its earned income, and I've noticed the parking charges have skyrocketed to that effect, um, they sought to build lodges in the north area of the wood to increase tourism here. But the local friends of Fine Shade worked with ex experts to important species that, are found, species that are found in the forest here, and planning permission was denied. Since then, the area has been reclassified by Natural England <coughs> as ancient or semi-natural woodland and will prevent any future plans to build on that particular part of the wood. So that reclassification was the result of researching the old maps and observational studies, similar to the research carried out when someone might be accessioning or deaccessioning objects in a museum's collection. 
I mentioned that part of a museum's purchase is to communicate and educate, to share knowledge and resources. And as a society, we have recently become much more aware of the forest and that it is much more than a collection of trees because they communicate with one another for the purpose of conservation and protection. When we took a view from below of the way the trees moved, and the image here is a uh, track by Graham Miller, um, we noticed that trees, some of them swayed backward and forward, others of them swayed in a circular motion, but none of them ever touched at the top. And so the trees were communicating above ground. But last year, research was published that discussed a subterranean communication network across the globe. Evidence gathered showed that beneath every forest and wood, there is a complex underground web of roots, fungi, and bacteria that connects trees and plants to one another. It's been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. Um, <laughs> it is a symbiotic relationship between the trees and the fungi that allows plants to communicate with one another to share, in effect, knowledge and resources. And studies have shown that this network can share resources <coughs> such as sugar, carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen and water. And even older trees that are dying will pass on nutrients, resources, to younger trees or saplings to allow their growth. The network also allows these plants to send warnings to one another. So if a plant is under attack from aphids, it will inform a nearby plant so it can raise its defences before the aphids reach it. And until recently, scientists had assumed that each plant only communicated with its own species. But studies at the University of British Columbia have shown that these mycorrhizal networks connect <coughs> hundreds of different trees across different species. So beneath a 30 meter square plot that they were studying of Douglas fir, they found that, that one tree was linked to 47 others. It has been known, of course, for some time that plants communicate above ground, as we saw during the track project. And this is by means of airborne hormones to share information. But the underground network is a much more precise form of communication because it determines both the source and the recipient of the knowledge transfer. So as a result of this new understanding, questions are being asked around whether a forest should be considered as a single superorganism. There is also an interesting overlap between the relationships that visitors have with museum collections and forests, which connects then with Abigail and Lala's residency and resulting exhibition. The notion and significance of ownership is a vital one for both museums and forests. And there are, you probably know, some very challenging questions at the moment being raised around the ownership and repatriation of objects in many national museums, such as the collection of indigenous Australian art, the Benin bronzes and the Parthenon sculptures at the British Museum. Who owns what are very complex and politically charged issues but it is clear that this is a matter of public interest and deep engagement with these ideas. And this depth of feeling was in evidence we noticed in 2011, when the government proposed a bill that it would allow it to sell off the forests managed by the Forestry Commission and owned by us. And this was eventually scrapped after more than half a million people signed the 38 Degrees petition. And the sense of loss of both trees and val valuable cultural objects has been made very tangible by artists. They have used 3D printers, for example, to recreate objects that have been destroyed by ISIS and have invited members of the public to donate books to refill a Baghdad library. Likewise, Anya Galaccio recently installed a sculpture of a tree in a park near the Whitworth in Manchester replacing one that had died. <coughs> and um, many of you might know that when the Corby Council was building the cube, the space needed to create the building was far larger than its actual footprint, and many trees had to be cut down. And those trees were part of Hazel and Thurisal Wood, which is the largest urban woodland in Europe. And on the first anniversary of the building's opening, we worked with Simon Hygens, and he projected this work, which he called a tree, onto the facade of the building, 
to highlight the impact of building on our environment. So in conclusion, through learning more about trees and forests and how we relate to them, in a similar way to the way that we might treasure and study objects in our museums, we learn much more about our history, our place in the world, and the development of a more sustainable society, which is definitely a key to our future. Thank you. I just want to say um, thanks for that. That was really good. Um, if there's an image or anything that you want to see again, did you say about the website? Did you say at the beginning about the website? No, we can have, afterwards, we, uh, we're, we're recording today, so we can, we'll be hosting things on the website afterwards. And any images. So a, um, any image that you like, because I'm going to zip through this very quickly. So if you see anything you like, you can always just find it on the website. So first of all, I want to start with this piece of music. Um, see if you can guess where it's from. Play it. Let's start with this piece of music. Turn it up. Turn it up. Oh dear, it's supposed to be much louder than that. Yes, yes. Yes, oh, you got it, great. I'm going to have to tell everybody. Underground, overground, wombling free. Wimbledon, common are we? Making good use of things that we've found. The things that the everyday folks leave behind. Cut. <laughs> so, that, now I can't claim this um, because if you were listening to Radio Northampton on Thursday morning, anybody listening to it? <laughs> Great. Well, um, the producers of Radio Northampton started my sound piece with the Wombles. And I, I hadn't thought, because I actually was a Womble when I was nine years old. We used to go wombling in Barnsbury and Islington. Uh, we, we found an old pram and we'd actually collect rubbish and make things from it. So although, next one, so this is, this is Jerry Wellsman, some artist that I've been thinking about that makes extraordinary pieces. So, next one. Um, so, you'll be seeing this exhibition, and um, we've sort of used these objects and made something different from them, things that people have left. So, not unlike the Wombles, we're sort of making a reuse for these and making art from them. So, next one. So, are you, this is the things you can see in the exhibition. Next one. Uh, and these are the artists that occupy my thoughts. I can see my, hear my echo. Yeah. This is Herbert Bayer. Oh, come Hello. In. Herbert. Herbert. <laughs> and keep going. Yeah, so Herbert Bayer. You can, you know, look them up. Anybody studying photography can look up these kind of artists that uh, occupy me. Objects floating. Okay. Um, these are like 1930. Nice. Kelly, Kelly, what date? Date, Kelly. 1929. Sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Next one. Um, and even from bullet time, this is the kind of um, feeling I got when I went through the installation that we put up when we suddenly froze in time and you can see these objects. Um, bullet time was evolved from. Next one. Um, Tim is. I have to look myself. Tim McMillan, yeah, he's sort of, he was making art and, and found this way from just exploring and experimenting and freezing um, objects or a thing happening in photography by using a lot of cameras. Next one. Um, and Abigail's kind of feeling about magic, about objects, you know, you can feel all of that. I hope you all feel that when you see the installation. And, you know, it's sort of just, you see a frozen object is floating. It, it's sort of like a magic, and it's an experience. And again, and again. And even Magritte, you can sort of um, think of this object that just floats, and you get this um, kind of feeling when you see people walk through the exhibition, and you see an object by their head. Um, I love this one. This is actually Dave... Um, Hill, who helped us with the lighting, uh, he's from Loughborough University, and you can see, I mean, having a, a baby's bottle by somebody's head, you can, it's sort of like that Magritte thing, is that what they're thinking, is that them? No, but, keep going. Uh, and this is, 
This is Andy Earthorn, and he helped us put the exhibition up. So you can see he's giving the objects lots of love. Next one. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you're doing an exhibition, there's a whole team of people that are helping you um, put things up with lighting, Dave, and again, Andy. Next one. Uh, and Yasmin using the Leicester, you know, we got help from Leicester Print Place. You, know, you have meetings and you bring lots of people together in your idea. Next one. Um, and some of the ideas was to put, uh, this is one from Abigail, that had sort of thinking about the objects, um, to kind of have them printed the actual size uh, of the object. So when you go into the end bit of the gallery, you'll see uh, the platinum prints, uh, and they, they're almost the same size as the actual object. We didn't get round to doing the umbrella. Next one. <coughs> Um, but if we'd done the umbrella, it would have been long and as big as the actual umbrella is. And that was a kind of thing, again, about documenting. Um, and you've got this kind of forensic way of um, looking at things. And uh, even with the label, it's like a museum. And you can read the label, read about the object, and it's almost like these objects that were just lost and not been claimed have now got a new life. And, this, and we'd got help from Loughborough University. So here you can see um, Ben and Alan, Duncan and Phil, Phil Ly, Professor Phil Ly, Linley, I'm going to say it wrong, and Abigail. And here we are um, um, exploring the possibilities. And this is where we made the platinum prints. They've got an amazing, behind Philip, they've got this amazing platinum printer. Um, and platinum is a very, very expensive um, way of printing a photograph, an old method. How old? I can't say. <laughs> Kelly will tell us. Hundreds of years, yeah? And 1860s onwards. And, um, you know, if you buy a bottle of pl tiny bottle of platinum, it's like 600 pounds. So um, just the materials. And so it's giving these found objects uh, even more importance by reproducing them in this method. Keep going. And that's this, uh, it, we photographed it with this idea of this forensic way of, um, rather than photographing it passionately, um, it was more of a kind of way of documenting something and a way of seeing something where you might think, uh, we used even ring flash that, that the, often these photographers use to just make sure they've lit the scene and there's no emotion or anything in it. Am I saying it right? Anyway, that's me, that's me um, photographing with this ring flash, you can see. Uh, and that, it, it, uh, Abigail took that, and it, it looks like, um, it's even like a crime scene with the torch being shone on it. And Next one. And then, you know, you can, it just makes me think of Gursky, so look him up, you students in the room. Gursky, next one. Or even Lisa Milroy, I'm thinking of objects and the way things are... Um, Listed, they're all in our minds. Mine and Abigail, I think I can speak for her. <laughs> and this is, uh, so there are 90 objects, uh, and you can see we've listed them um, 1 to 90. Uh, and, the, and another bit of importance that the object has, it has a number, and that's the number it owes. It is number 23, so we can find it. Another way of ordering it. Um, and you can see the Lisa Milroy connection. If, I'm just doing this backwards. The next one. And there's number 35, you see. Next one. 31. You can read where it was found and has a bit of... Point. Now you can see that 31 hanging up somewhere in the exhibition. Next one. 18. Somebody's lost a comb. And this is while, during the residency in our hotel room. And we've, you know, we've bagged up the objects. We took it from lost property and um, we were numbering it, laying it out. So that's what our um, room looked like as we were working. And I had a bit of a deja vu, actually. Um, so if you go to the next one. So look at that. So that's, and now 32 years earlier, go back. Is that not, has anything changed? It's exactly the arms, everything. So I had a deja vu there uh, because me and Abigail go back a long way. Um, exactly maybe 35 years. We shared a studio in, um, at Goldsmiths. And so we've, we've, we go back a long ways. 
Um, and this is us in the woods, keep going. So, and these are the people we met as we were doing this residency. Uh, this is Phil, um, and he's been working here the longest in the Forestry Commission, something like 40 or, or maybe a long time. Um, and we went for walks with these people. Next one. Uh, and we, we kind of explored. And so we didn't know what we were going to do at the beginning. We went and looked around. Uh, we tried at night. We tried um, setting off bombs. These are smoke bombs. So we just tried setting them off and in the middle of the night and kind of running away and seeing what that effect. And we, that, that may come to something, but not this time. Next one. Uh, we, we took a night photography of wildlife. Next one. Um, and these are the dogs that belong to the uh, Forestry Commission people. This is uh, Carl and Sam. And they helped us by... They have these time sequence um, and they're monitoring the wildlife. So one of our thoughts was maybe doing something with the wildlife. And who knows, it may happen, some other exhibition. And the people, the walkers, and we, we loved some, some of the objects. We tried to persuade this man to leave his object, but <laughs> no, he was holding on to it. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Next one. Um, and this is a 400-year-old pollarded... Andrew, is it... What was it? Was it beach? Or what did your mum say? It was an ash or a beach? All right, it's one of those. <laughs> it's a 400-year-old... Really, really, really old tree. And it's, it's, it's survived a, it's a, so long. It's a, is home, it? it's a home beam. Right? It's a home. Well, Thank you. Did it say that? But anyway. Um, <laughs> it's a, and it's, it's survived because it's been pollarded all the years. That's how it's made it survive. Did you know that? That's how it's been able to survive so, so long. Anyway, it's amazing, isn't it? So we found out all these things. Uh, and there it is. It's just, I love these old trees. But we also found objects. And we, it was a question, next one, as to whether an object is... <laughs> Is that lost property or is it rubbish? The Wombles would know that. Um, next one. Um, so there was a question, and, and even now we're thinking we should have put that in or, uh, because maybe somebody does want that wig and they lost it, as you do walking in the woods. Next one. Um, and we, we've got maps, and we, we, so we've spent a residency really getting to know as those other artists that Yasmin mentioned. Uh, and sort of um, creating this art piece. Next one. And that you, you've got these beautiful woods. Next one. And here is Scott, I think it is. Next one. Also get, taking us for a walk. Um, it's... I've forgotten to hold it. <coughs> Scott and Phil, another... That's right, that's Phil. So there's Scott and Phil. Who, and these are the offices that are just next door here, and we got to know people... Next one. And as we were having an interview, somebody, a member of the public, brought in a baby bird that had fallen from a nest. So these are the usual things people are doing. Uh, and it's being saved, hopefully. And, um, you know, we're sort of discussing and getting to know people and seeing what, what it is in, that goes on in a wood. Uh, and it was the lost property book that caught our attention and that won the, you know, got, got made it to the final exhibition. Uh, and here's Sarah, Sarah Walker, isn't it? Yep. And here she is with her lost property book. And, and she collects all the lost property. And we, we bagged it all. Keep going. This, this is just through the night. We looked at night images. And so uh, at the very beginning, this, you, we, were, we were shown round. Um, and here's James. And Jessica's somewhere in the background. Um, and you've kind of shown this space and go to the, pre the one before that. No, the one before. So you, you're kind of presented with this beautiful wood and somehow you have to make that journey <laughs> to an empty gallery. How do you do it? Next one, employ Abigail. So Ab and this was Abigail. I think it was with this piece that attracted you to Abigail in the first place. So this is one of Abigail's work that's, that's calling, give me an artist residency in a wood, it says. <laughs> Next one. And um, just, to, this is where I start because we're doing it backwards. This is a still from Freeze. That's Michael Landy and Sarah Lucas's work. Look it up. The, and here you see Abby's, Abigail's work and then my work and Sarah and Michael Landy's in the, through the corridor at Freeze. And I'm only just sort of looking again and seeing that Abigail's got these buttons that 
thrown over something like a typewriter or an object, and I've got buttons in mind. So there's some kind of conversation going on even 32 years ago. Next one. And you can see it better, Abigail and my work in Freeze. Next one. And then that's how it begins, I think. That's the beginning. Yes. Thank you. Should have, I should have reversed it backwards. Anyway, now over to... Other one. Um, <laughs> I don't know who else is thinking about this. Can we do anything about the heating? And can we get rid of the lights so it, yeah. it's like proper church? <laughs> um, so uh, while while that's being done, I'll just say that that freeze is spelt with two e's and a z and then an e. Uh, and it was an exhibition made by some Goldsmith students in 1988. And the reason that building, that show could happen was because a building, we could sort of say, not unlike these, was a leftover because in 1966, the first, and remember that date, the first container arrived in Britain. There were no containers before 1954 none anywhere and the first container arrived in 1966 and that's the end of the docks so as i've driven through england today i've just watched i came from london i have just seen the dereliction of my lifetime which i guess any lifetime will produce any 70 year period is like whoops didn't work whoops doesn't work whoops can't work and then what do you do and we had a little joke at lunchtime about gentrification. And I would say that if demography was taught in school, you wouldn't need to discuss it because it's us. It's called being born, growing up, having an ambition, failing to have an ambition, moving around, codes. You've got to have all this heat in this room. You better have this kind of lighting because it's the new da-da-da. It's a huge machine that we all live in, and it's fine to finger point, but I think sometimes we would be better off just looking in the front of our nose. I didn't expect to say that, but because you didn't explain where Freeze was, stuff has a context. We have a context. Everyone's got a story about how we got here today. So this talk was made for that wall. Never do a public talk where this is like you're at home. It's a crime. There are going to be two images, you're not going to be able to read them, so I will let them go through and I'll say stuff and uh, you can come and beat me up afterwards. But it'll be slightly, I'm slightly Tourette-ish, so it might be in the spirit of some of what I've said already. So these lights, can they go? Please? <coughs> so I'm a, uh, um, a 1947 child. I'm probably not quite the oldest person in the room, but I go for it. And I was given this, people give me stuff. I was given this map the other day. And I really love that three stations, which I know extremely well, are all represented in exactly the same way uh, because they're stations. And then on the front, there's a bit of... I'm this kind of station because I'm Euston, or I'm this kind of station because I'm St Pancras. And some of you know that. Not a very good representation of King's Cross. And on the same map is a piece of water which I've always wondered about. And I used to cross that road there, there, as a child and wonder why there was a funny bridge. But I come from an anti-intellectual, uncurious household and it was never discussed. So... <laughs> I went for a walk in that space, not quite, on, I, I try not to do anything on purpose. I, uh, I was invited for breakfast with somebody with rather considerable amounts of power at their disposal and of course I went and I had that breakfast round the corner. So this is what Eric Hobsbawm calls the near edge of the East End. I don't know how many people know London but you'll forgive me. But 
he called Camden Town the near edge of the East End. And I remember reading it and thinking, absolute bollocks. You know, the East End probably begins somewhere like Whitechapel or, you know, we could draw a map. But actually, of course, he's right. So la -di -da London ends in Regent's Park with the last bit of, surprise, surprise, royal family is broke, what should we do? Oh, we could develop the park. What are you doing on Tuesday? John Nash is coming. Oh, we could put some sort of theatre sets around and paint them white, which is what Regent's Park is, which is just over there. And that is sort of the end of la -di -da London. And as you go east, it get you more used to find people on the bus with dirt under their fingernails. I think there are people here who know what dirt under the fingernails means. You don't see any dirt under the fingernails anymore because you're not allowed to get dirty fingernails because you must wear gloves on site. So this is a real social moment. The railway lines to Euston are just on the back of that wall. On the front of that wall, surprise, surprise, is a lot of bollocks about selling property. It used to be called houses. <laughs> this is a toilet which I had to use because I was desperate. And I was very surprised at the repair to the toilet, which I still don't know what, I like the unaccountable. <laughs> so in the corner of the very large mirror, I don't know why that's necessary in a <laughs> toilet, um, is a stainless steel mirror. So if you're a man and you're peeing, you're kind of going, whoa, <laughs> wild. <laughs> And I can tell you the pub, and it's, of course it's not a pub, it's a gastro breakfast place, but it's worth a visit. Next. <laughs> so then there's a, this is called Park Village East, which has got one of the most interesting, if you curve a wall it's going to be stronger. So it's got a little bit of brick, bricky wicky garden wall. And immediately opposite is something that didn't used to exist, and it's what I call Because You Can. You can print anything, on anything, anytime, any place. You're driving on the motorway and a ham the size of this room goes past you and you go... <laughs> which is what, of course, they used to say about pop art. But that was kind of... almost had love in it. That had... My name is Rosenquist and I can paint you a big ham. But this is... Oh dear, we've got roadworks and I will do you a trellis. And the, so this and this are in quite a conversation. Next. The stuff written up everywhere, just read it. I watch The Crown, I love it. I think, bastards to have thought of that. You know, think of what is the one, one soap opera that the whole world knows about. Oh my God, it's the royal family. Oh, we could fictionalise it. I mean, imagine being in the bath one morning and thinking of that. So, uh, this commemorates the Duke of Edinburgh making a visit in 1955. I, can, I wasn't there, but... But I think a, a, um, any tablet, and I would prefer them not to be in graveyards, but any tablet, they are amazing in how they give stuff away. So this is when London was run by uh, parishes and vestries that long before anyone had, could pronounce LCC. Um, I think that's 1877. And there's always a list of people, and they're always, you know, they're always very pleased with themselves, and they've got letters after their name. Next. But then you go into Park Village West, which I have never been in my life. I mean, how crap is that? And you are in serious theatre. This is 1825. And, you know, this is early deep basements, complete bollocks, all, all casting. It's basically very early Rachel White reads and a coat of paint. But there's, you know, that is not a wreath. That is not an urn. This is when we had a world of workshops and illiterate people who could cast well. Next. And you carry that on down the street. You can go backwards and forwards. You can bump into bits of Regent's Park. You get a fantastic essay on intelligent 60s building. Absolutely appalling Thatcher building. Uh, and of course, it's London. They're just going chatter, 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 chatter. That's not their fault. I can be snobbish about it, but... That's what they do. It's probably bomb damage. And then there's a great moment here where you get, you know, the uh, icon of the 60s. You get, oh, telecommunications meets the church. Next. And point of view is good fun, I think. But what I was looking for was uh, the, the missing dock, 
which is called, um, begins with C. Uh, no, dyslexic. Uh, no, actually it's called, Marina Warner told me, it's called late life, no, it's not late life disinhibition. It's um, nominal, uh, nominal aphasia. Um, anyway, this is an absent dock, more or less where the previous photograph was taken. So this is a dock that's been filled in from the canal. In fact, is the bottom of that strip of water and is now right in the middle of London is allotments. And I cannot tell you how joyful they are to find if you've made the walk I had made next. And they're full of little things that we all probably here know when we had the stationary cabinet the stationary cabinet that no longer needs to exist. So the stationary cab cabinet has become the garden cabinet, cupboard. And this one has rather gorgeously burst, so its contents are coming out the back. <laughs> Slightly how I feel. Um, some of you know about rustication, discuss. That is not rustication, but it wants to be, probably 1962. And these are brackets called, I'm sorry you're in London and everything falls to pieces and I'll hold it together. Next. <laughs> so uh, if I climb on the roof of my house, I can see this. Um, it's not my view, but I can make it my view. So that little block there, that's Senate House. That's where Orwell worked during the war. That is the Ministry of Truth. That's where the image came from. So when you reread 1984, it sort of existed because it was a modern building at the time, 1935 maybe. This is St Pancras, da, da, da. and then these cranes, it's a crap photograph, I know, that's Google. Discuss. Oh, and this person has just replaced all their chimney pots, so it looks like 1842. <laughs> Next. Nearly at the end, I realised recently that road, R-O-A-D, is actually a typical English corruption of R-O-D-E, as in... <coughs> so roads are actually something to do with the old means of transport. And this is a man I slightly know who's got a new tractor and he's widening the road, but he doesn't perhaps mean to. And that's real architecture. That's when you make a little hole in a limestone wall, dry stone wall, uh, for the animals. But I never know whether it's so you can kill them when they come through, or whether it's because you're... And we don't really... We're really, I would say, we are so uneasy about that word nature. I mean, we use it but it's us who nominates it. I talk to the cat in the morning and I go, so who's nature here? <laughs> no reply. <laughs> Next. Some of you know that this is something I have a deep illness about, but these are what you would call, I would call highly, well, polite, of course, really means in the city, as in polis, and vernacular means not in the city. So they are a kind of vernacular of the polis, but they are sort of polite. Somebody just puts their glass down or doesn't want it to blow away and they push it in. And of course the glass, we haven't got Roland Barthes with us, but the glass is actually plastic. Next. If you go around the back in uh, what I think was probably bombed, the back of, uh, I think it's Hanover Terrace, these steps are uneven, and I've got a, uh, a late life falling to pieces knee, so I really watch steps, but this is just gorgeous. I mean, that is not slightly out. What's conventionally called, excuse me, fucking well out. <laughs> and as you're going down, it's going, oh my God. But it's not subsidence. That is like Charlie knocking off on a Friday night, and you know, well, they won't notice. Uh, but... The steps are much better for that because they become the steps where there's the one out. Next. State of the country. Uh, <laughs> actually, of course, it's a typo. It's meant to be House of Windsor. But, and that is actually the estate. I really do recommend the estate because it's an old, 
it's old, um, it's a crown estate that's been given over to Peabody. And it's got a kind of strange, it really does feel like old London. I mean, you're nearly on the Euston Road and it's got a kind of extraordinary decorum. People say good morning to each other. There's one of everybody. It's quite like going to sort of magic theatre and everything is called after that patch. I think there's a Datchet house, there's an Ascot house. Next. And then, of course, you break out of that and you come into what's called North Gower Street. Uh, and this is a Bangladeshi area. This is the corner of a mosque. And whoever did this, I mean, they should get the Nobel Prize for decor because you obviously understand that railings are the beginning of Ikea. They're, you know, there's a few foundries, there's 10 patterns, cast them, probably stick them in a barge, send them off by canal, and oh, we've got railings. But that's where they came from. They're generic. But this is, I'm a bit worried about all the blown rubbish. And somebody, I don't think they even perhaps realised that it comes with this on the top. Top right-hand side of North Gower Street, if you want to see if it's true. Next. This is a man I would love to celebrate. You can look him up. He's called Gerard Dalton, D-A-L-T-O-N. An Irishman, Irish immigrant, not far from Paddington. Died this summer. I never met him. And I really feel like I knew him. And he worked for 30 years. Nobody knew anything about it. So more or less, secretly. Or where does secret meet private? So privately. And um, I think he's as good as Acta Cheval or Simon Rodier. And there's talk that the GLA maybe the mayor's office or maybe the National Trust might actually take an attitude to it. But it is completely wonderful. But look it up. Next. And nearly at the end, this is a 19, I'll go for 58. We can all remember who we were. Jigsaw puzzle, which I bought rather a bit too spontaneously for uh, a tenner plywood, very well cut out. Any of you who've ever made anything, you know that if you want to make a jigsaw, you go zzzz. You can do it by hand. You follow the lines and you will end up with the perfect jigsaw and you put the pieces back together again. I was a bit hasty and I didn't notice that Rutland was missing. And I know where we are. And I had to remake it. And I can tell you that something smaller, I'm quite good at making things, smaller than your little fingernail to make out of the right size plywood is so annoying. Uh, and it's not bad. And then my wife, who isn't here, but is a very good colorist, said, I need to match it, which I thought was a bit boring, but I thought, well, sharing, you know, late life marriage. And uh, so, da 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 da, paints it. Look at that. And then the paint dries, and it's the wrong blue. Ha. Well, it's the wrong tone. And in a way, I would suggest to you that that's what your show is about. That's why, you know, the world is... Trees do get chopped down, but they, most trees don't live more than the length of a human life. You know, chop them down and plant four where you've chopped one down. Have a different attitude to it. You know, this is not very good oak in here because we just don't do oak anymore because we use 2,000 oak trees for every ship. Every bloody East Indiaman, that's a couple of thousand oak trees. Disgust. Next. Thank you. That's 15 minutes each. What time? F the light's going. Walking. It's back on. So we'll open it up to questions. Are you going to chat? Yeah, any, any questions? Is there any water? Any questions? Any questions, <coughs> any questions anybody? Top of your head. I took a sweet preview of your exhibition. Just so I arrived here. 
what fascinates me is the, the other side of that coin. You talked about being forensic about the objects and discovering them. But when you came to put it together, the beauty to it seems to have taken over. A conscious idea that the thing would look aesthetically pleasing. And that's the image. As I walked in there, knowing nothing about what you've done, knowing nothing about where the things have come from, the thing that struck me immediately was how beautiful this looks. Yeah. Now, was that a conscious decision at some point, that you moved from what could be forensic, and you showed photographs of um, dark glasses lunged out, which is more, more stand back than what they are, although they were tipped in different directions slightly, so they talked to each other a bit. But your exhibition takes that further. It seemed to be consciously beautiful. Was that something you were aware of? I think so, because I don't think it was meant to be only forensic. Forensic is just one strand that you can sort of understand from it. So there are lots of things in this that you can get from it. But at the end, you want to walk into an exhibition and see something beautiful, because it's going to affect you. Yes, it so, does. It takes you to another place. Yeah, that's it's so just it's what definitely... we've just been talking about, finding beauty. Yes. But, I... this, but beauty, mainly, in his particular part of Factory of London. Yes. It's what you've somehow done in that room, which is really beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's supposed to be the different things, but then in the end you want to people to come in and, and just feel moved. Yeah. So there, that was intentional, but yeah. the forensic thing was another strand of thinking about representing objects and things. I was going to say, they went to art school. <laughs> yeah, we, and we studied. <laughs> and guess who was... I, I didn't say that he was our tutor. I mean, it's his fault. Blame We're him. Dam damaged goods. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a compliment. I'm on the repair. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You had an image of some plastic pearls on the screen. Did you lose them? <laughs> I just wondered if you did find, did you find any real pearls? Um, no, only ones of wisdom from all the people. <laughs> but no, no, just the wisdom pearls. But uh, nothing. Uh, we, we did find a li nice gold le necklace, didn't we? And that, I think that might have been claimed or just had gone for a walk. So um, we, we didn't find it anymore. It was listed in the book and then it just disappeared. Or maybe somebody came and claimed it, you know. So there were. Uh, the, the thing is, the, the things that were of, very, of great value, people will try and find you know so I guess these were things that people thought no one would pick up or we even didn't know where they'd lost them who's done that and they just got no idea so um, yeah good thanks yeah so I had a sort of weird response as I walked in sort of thinking that this was a sort of a, 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 and I use the word sort of happy and cheerful version of my experience of going to Auschwitz 20 years ago um, and actually seeing the two talks together, which kind of feel like, I, I'm presuming that they weren't, you didn't make your talk, Richard, as a result of, of these guys' exhibition. They were just kind of... I made it two nights ago. Okay. <laughs> but they and I made this, mine last night, so... They have a kind of <laughs> sensibility of of, uh, of, of, like, where we are right now, which is in a kind of quite scary place where it's a real joy to be in this room with wonderful people who have kind of pearls of wisdom about their uh, enjoyable response to the world, but they both felt very much about a kind of a, 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 a tragic and empty past that maybe doesn't actually necessarily include in human, humans in the future. <laughs> and it's sort of, and I feel like, um, you know, I, for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of feeling excited about the... Uh, the, the opportunity for for um, for us all to think about how we as artists can can build talks and exhibitions like this where we feel the joy of the the, the future with humans in it. Yeah, I think that. I think I'm, this I'm, is. I'm hoping that, that this is going to be something I'm going to experience in the yes. very near future. But if we locked the door and didn't let anyone go home for the next whatever, and we found out who everybody was here we would be very humbled. I mean, imagine the, the endless narratives of each person and their relationships and so forth. And that you can't be here by accident. 
I mean, this is a polite, this is a really polite, this is about as nice an audience as I have ever met. In the middle of, you know, it's not convenient to be here. So everyone's made an effort to be here. And that in itself is, is you know, we're in a lifeboat. This is a kind, I mean, for, to me, it's my sort of lifeboat in my head. I might have sounded Saki when I was making my way from Parkway to Euston Road, but actually I was, you know, I'm quite a friendly sort of person. I probably said hello to a few people on the way. I must have appeared in a lot of CCTV. Um, but actually, of course, that's what, that's really what most humans are doing. They're, I mean, if you live in London, it's actually quite, it's quite, you have to be quite old to say good morning to people. I mean, people are shocked. Good morning. <laughs> so this, I think what you just said, though, is that there is a sort of comfort in here. There's a kind of, uh, it's, it's not comfortable. I don't think, yeah. Yeah. It was more. Uh, it was a moment of saying, saying, I'm, 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 I loved both the talks and the exhibition, and I'm loving being in here. Yes. And I'm making a hope, for the, a wish for the future, which is that, that that we can, like, you know, be as a group, as 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 a, as a wider community, coming to these talks where we feel the real kind of possibility that humans can be in the future. Well, that sort of brings it to Yasmin and James, the people that all raise the money and make it possible to do thing, more things like this. So more things like this <laughs> is, is definitely, you know, what we need. There was a man at the back, I think, was what? Yeah. Oh, you're... <laughs> if I say Damien, then everyone will know I know you, and they'll think you can't answer the question. Um, the exhibition made me actually think of... Uh, Joseph Pursuit's one in three series. So you have the, um, at the front you have like the text that tells you what we've done. And then you have these playful objects. And then you have these photographs of the objects as well. So you've got these sort of the three things that, three ways of, of being perhaps. And I wondered what was at stake for you between, in the conversation between language and objecthood and image making. <laughs> okay, well, well, to put it, maybe to put it more simply, what's the difference between, Ian, what's the difference between a toy gun and a photograph of a toy gun? The photograph looks like a real gun. It does, doesn't it? It's shocking. <laughs> I went in the wrong way and I saw the gun and I'm a bit like, oh, hang on a minute. You know, like we've got teddy bears and pistols. Like, you know, and, and, oh, you, you went in through the photographs? Yeah. I, I, I have a natural habit to do things the wrong way around. So, uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I saw, the, I, saw the, I saw the images first. And that, that gun was shocking. And then the moment that you see that it's purple and yellow plastic, you're like, oh, it's fine. But um, what's happening? What would, uh, is one more important than the other? Or is, you know, because one is really luscious and joyful and the other is very austere. What, was it, what, was, what were you thinking about when you were making those works? Or I think just... About putting them together? It's just showing different ways of, you know, showing something, looking at the object and seeing how important it is, seeing it trans... You knowing that it's a lost property, knowing what it actually is, mm -hmm. and then seeing it um, photographed in that way. You could even think about when you do see evidence in a courtroom and how things have changed, like the glove in the O.J. Simpson or something like that. There's, um, you know, these objects have meanings, and the way that they're portrayed are different, so you can go from each room and have a different experience. But I'll answer that in full at the end. <laughs> yeah. By photographing it, you're making it live longer in a way. Yeah. You know, you're recording it and it's going to be there forever now. Yes. Even if you lose it again. Yeah, the that's picture right. picture is there. The picture's there. Yeah. I, I think it was that I wanted to pick up on this idea of ownership and the idea of the lost objects and then almost like the idea of some of the objects have got kind of signatures on them. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they say Pally Toy or they've got a little Cadbury's logo on them. It's almost like they could be returned to the factories or they could be returned <laughs> to the shops. Yes, yes. Returned to the industries whence they came. Um, and maybe the child grew up and so it lost it because it didn't need it anymore. Yes, uh, it lost there that is idea. a... So where, uh, it was the question of ownership, basically, and also that in relationship to uh, authorship 
Yes. Authorship and ownership. Well, that's a really good point. Um, it, the whole thing was like intellectual property, uh, was a sort of subtitle, because um, we did have discussions and things about who actually owns the work of art. So it's a really good comment, um, a question. Um, and so that does, it is a question on ownership, the whole exhibition as well. Another thought, another strand that goes in to all the different things that are shown there. So that, that's good. We'd have um, had a lot of discussion about it, and then we took in this intellectual property because who knows who owns it anymore? The artists. Yeah, it's sort of following on from that, that ownership thing is it's the, it's the stories behind of many of those objects. So the one in particular that struck me is that kind of it's a kind of medical sandal. Yes, the orthopedic sandal. sandal. Yeah. Well, that, that person must be hopping mad. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They didn't come and claim it. You have to think. They might have thought it just would, wasn't handed in or something. But yeah. Not cured in the forest because the forest mycelium worked on them. Yes. I did. I can be myself. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, these labels are often, we found them in the book as well, so when they, people were labelling it, they described it, so you had this kind of descriptions in that lost property book. Another question? A question of what about selections? Did you select them all? Did you, were you aware of how you were selecting if you weren't selecting them all? Yes, we, we, we used them all, so there was no selection. That's the, all 90 were the, what was lost from our beginning of our residency to the end. So that's from that period of time. Who knows what's been lost, you know, since. You know, they might have collected some other things. It would be good to, maybe to keep adding to it. Or, or We even thought we had the conversation about what if someone saw um, one of their objects in the art piece. Um, <laughs> What's it back? Yeah. <laughs> Would, would, would they want it back? Yes, that's true. Did you leave this behind? Yeah. Did they keep, because there was something, well, maybe they didn't know there was an exhibition, they might have chucked it out, some very, very tiny things. Do you think that because they knew that things were going to be exhibited? People are starting to... <laughs> really tiny little plastic earrings and things. And yeah, well, we had a joke when I came with my mother about a month ago. She, she lost her hat. Um, and we had to go back and look for it in the toilet, but there was lots of jokes about how it might be in the end up at the <laughs> exhibition. We, so to we, we did look for lost property. We were looking when we went for walks, and um, in, when we found the wig, we found a little pink hat. Um, so we were very careful to bring more whatever we found to the lost property. Yes. Um, I used to do it with finding out later that my mother had planted things and rather than thinking that oh. I was just furious. You know, the way she took me out of the arena, I thought I'd found these things. It was like yeah, no, we tried not to make, we didn't want to make anything up, so those were the actual, but, but we had the wombles, you had Pippi Longstocking, but we were wombles. <laughs> um, is it lost uh, or discarded? I mean, lost is something of value, or perceived value, I should say. Discarded is perceived negative value, considered waste, because there's no waste in nature, which is a characteristic that we've forgotten, that a lot of these objects are plastic, they're going to be there for a long time. Um, some of them, by definition, historically, post-1970s, because they're plastics. Yeah. Um, so, you know, 2,000 or 2,000 years ago, we'd have different levels of junk or precious things that people would discard unwittingly or have lost, caches of gold in fields, and now it's plastic or clogs or bits of clothes or something else. Are you an archaeologist? Uh, and no, I'm not. Um, but it just <laughs> seems to me that, uh, I mean, that some of these things are waste, and they become waste anyway. And what we have is, because there's more of us now, we have more waste, and it's building up in forests. So it's, it's matter, if it is, it is matter, yes, but it's matter in the wrong place. And, like uh, weeds. And all of that. And I just wondered, because you say it's lost property, 
I'm just wondering, given that all items which are there, yeah. a lot of them are going to be discarded. Um, Very rare moment. They were perceived by the people who handed in. That, that's but that's the agent of the person who, you know, because everybody here is nice, we've all handed something in. Mm. I've also pocketed a few fivers. <laughs> I, have a, I, ha I have a son who just finds cash. I don't think any of those things have been, like, on purpose, like, just thrown, thrown <coughs> in the forest, like, to get rid of them. There was no but I don't think so. The wig, I think the wig is brilliant. Well, the wig wasn't handed in, so it didn't go in the exhibition. Oh. No, was it was a the question. Not, didn't not put it in plastic bottles. But, yeah, but I think the plastic bottle was discarded accidentally by the child. I don't, I don't think the mum would want to uh, put, the, put the, the, the baby's bottle and, start, and just, just discard it. Don't want mine. Oh, well, this is dirty. Well, I'm just going to leave that in the forest. You don't live where I live. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that they're accidents. It's a succession of each one's a succession of accidents. But I think what's interesting is that obviously very soon from this moment going forward, plastic will become. Uh, a thing of the future become banned. It'll be, be, uh, not, not, it won't happen anymore. So you know, the future archaeologists will be digging up plastic, going, "Oh, you know, this is in the 2000s. This is probably from the 2000s." And they'll be studying the plastic and going, like, "Wow, look at this old thing, this plastic thing." Yeah. Um, and looking at it like that. Future, yeah. Well, whatever. Well, actually, we could celebrate that there is a man at the Pitt Rivers called um, Dan Hicks, and that he's been doing that for 30, 40 years. So if, it's, if it is something you're interested in, Dan Hicks is very mm. ahead of his time, ahead of our time. Yes? <laughs> I was going to ask both, both you and Abigail, like, yeah. like how the, the um, collaboration worked and, and, and do you feel that there, is a, 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 there are future collaborations between you to come? You, you want to answer? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was, for me, from my point of view, it was fascinating to work, because I don't usually do collaborations, and so it was interesting to work with Abigail because of the way she works, and she's like a power force. So, um, you know, it was, it was, I could just sit back and have, a good, have an amazing journey. So it was interesting in seeing how she works, it, um, and... That's what I found very fascinating. Can I ask a cooperative question of everybody, slightly provoked by this man? Has anyone had or picked up the wrong suitcase at the airport? Okay, that's interesting. So we've got three people here. So you picked them up or was yours was lost? Oh, mine was lost. Oh, sorry, four. No, but I, I, Lo I didn't lost, pick it up. Lost? You, you lost mine your own. No, you picked up the wrong one. Picked up the wrong one? Both. 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 Okay, we have... So, and then add one more. It was more to do with the sort of... the fable in the afternoon, which is that I got from Heathrow to King's Cross into my house with a case and then got a call from the airport saying, you haven't got your case, sir. And I went, yes, I have. I was very tired. <laughs> Little telephone argument... Will you please look in your case, sir? So, look in the case. Not my case. Really, because... <laughs> Take, when you go back to the airport, when I went back to Heathrow, where you feel very, very stupid. I mean, there, is an, there was an explanation, but you do feel very stupid. Two things that somehow relate to this afternoon. First thing, incredibly sexy. You re-enter the airport from the wrong way. She's like, Wow. So you end up in the luggage by the wrong route and no one is asking where you've been, sir, and um, why, why is your jacket so fat and whatever normally happens. So you arrive because you're sort of kosher and then you immediately start saying, I'm really sorry, I just, I'm an idiot. And 50 times a day. 50 idiots a day. <laughs> so, I mean, that's somehow in... All, yeah, I mean, I went, fine. But I think that's in all this, we are the, f we're, Heathrow, yeah. But. 50, 50 idiots just in Heathrow. Well, I didn't then, pursue it, I just felt better. I, <laughs> but I think, I think because we're discussing, because we're slightly discussing what is it to get lost, what is it, what is mislaid, 
and how do these guys get involved in this, that it's quite, you have to have a lot of stuff for it to become a subject. And I think that, that happened in, in the last 40, 50 years. I don't think you could have made this show in 1935. <coughs> mm. It wouldn't be very interesting. Well, that just, it was the theatre of it, or just being able to and have a mood uh, and, and to move yourself out of the space so you didn't see the walls or, and you just saw the objects that were sort of highlighted like a magic trick floating. Um, and you could observe and see it from underneath and around and just see it in a way that you don't usually see objects. They're so usually holding onto them or they're on the side or something. So it was just a a way like in theatre, looking at things, and they are theatre lights in there. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was one more question, and then we could uh, have tea. the light right over inside. One over here. Is, Is it that you won't let them go until you've had yes, one more you. question? <laughs> <laughs> In, in the woods themselves, yeah. actually, Edwina, the first artist who see. was the first residency in this program, she oh, had some work in the space. Yeah. She also had some work in the forest as well. Have to me yeah. I think they keep picking them up. It's really funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can, can I ask one? It's not an airport's question, but how many people here is English not their first language? Yes. Because I once did something around trees. It was a sort of Prince Charlesy type thing, which was like, well, they didn't come from here, mate. You know, if you go back, if you're, there's probably somebody here who is the right kind of. Um, geographer, scientist, if you go back, they're not, uh, you know, just, this is just a very bizarre climate in which most stuff thrives. So actually, when we go, oh, the English landscape, you know, this is all migratory, you know, with a couple of exceptions. So that was very nice to have, because 40 years ago, we wouldn't have had six or seven hands go up. And nor may it last. Yeah. No, you, it, it, you. <laughs> okay, we round, round it up there. Brilliant, and, well uh, done. Yes, oh, well done. Drinks served um, across the courtyard next to the artwork. Drinks, everybody. <laughs>